Hey, shalom everyone. This is Chris Shoemaker, also known as Yehuda Ben Shomer, and welcome to the 613 Commandment Exposition, where we take a look at the 613 Commandments and learn how to apply them to our daily lives here in the 21st century. So this is the fifth installment of the series, and this particular series is dealing with 14 commandments regarding love and brotherhood. So let's dig right into it. Now, the first commandment in this series that we're going to be dealing with is a positive commandment. It's an affirmative commandment. In other words, it's a thou shalt, one that you will do, and it's basically to love all human beings. Yeah, that pretty simple enough to love mankind to love your fellow man and it's taken from leviticus chapter 19 verse 18 and it says do not take revenge or bear a grudge against members of your community but love your neighbor as yourself you remember the people that asked yeshua jesus what is the greatest commandment and without a moment's hesitation, he says to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. The second is like unto it, or the second is equal to the first, or this one is, you know, one and the same with the first commandment, and that is love your neighbor as yourself. And after all, isn't that part of the golden rule? Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Treat others the way you want to be treated, simply put. And that is a commandment that stretches across all ethnicities, all age brackets, all socioeconomic strata, all religions. The only exception is Satanism, because their golden rule is do what thou wilt is the whole of the law. In other words, do whatever you want. It doesn't matter. You know, do what you want to do. In other words, put yourself first. Be your own God. Bow down to yourself. But other than that, this is... A commandment that stretches across all different, um, you know, religions, ethnic groups, age brackets, socioeconomic strata, etc. So this commandment is likened unto the golden rule. You know, this one says, "Love your neighbor as yourself," whereas the golden rule says, "Do unto others as you would have them do unto you." Now it's very interesting that that particular uh, commandment is found in all the other major religions of the world. And so, uh, you know, of course, we know Judaism and Christianity. Um, so let's see what Islam has to say about it. In the Hadith, the Prophet Muhammad said, uh, Not one of you truly believes until you wish for others what you wish for yourself. Now, the Hadith is not the Quran. The Hadith is a kind of a commentary on the Quran, also other sayings that has been attributed to the Prophet Muhammad. And so we see that that thread of love your neighbor as yourself or the golden rule reaching into Islam, which, uh, you know, people consider Christianity, Judaism and Islam as the major three Abrahamic and or monotheistic religions. Now, the Baha'i faith uh, from Baha'u'llah, uh, from his work called The Gleanings, he said, lay not on any soul a load that you would not wish to be laid up on you, and desire not for anyone for things you would not desire for yourself. Again, it's just another way of putting the golden rule or the second greatest commandment. Hinduism says in Mahabharata, probably pronounced that wrong, but 5, uh, verse uh, uh, 1517, it says, This is the sum of duty. Do not do to others what would cause pain if done to you. Now, the Buddha said, uh, treat not others in ways that you yourself would find hurtful. Confucius said, one word which sums up the, basic, the basis of all good conduct, loving kindness, do not do to others what you do not want done to yourself. Now, uh, Lao Tzu uh, in uh, Taoism, basically says, regard your neighbor's gain as your own gain and your neighbor's loss as your own loss. So it's interesting as we're going through the different major world religions that we're finding that common uh, touchstone, that common foundation, that common thread of the golden rule of loving your neighbor as yourself. Now Sikhism, uh, the guru uh, Granth Sahib said, if a uh, I am a stranger to no one and no one is a stranger to me. 
Indeed, I am a friend to all. Now, Unitarianism, uh, the principle found in that, says we affirm and promote respect for the interdependent web of all existence of which we are a part. So that's a big, convoluted, fancy way of summarizing the golden rule or kind of touching on the same thing as the golden rule. Now, in Native American spirituality, Chief Dan George says, we are as much alive as we keep the earth alive. So, you know, that's kind of another way of saying do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Now, in Zo uh, Zoroastrianism, it said, do not do unto others what is injurious to yourself. And finally, Jainism, or Jainism uh, says, one should treat all creatures in the world as one would like to be treated. Again, the only exception in the major world religions we find is Satanism, uh, which is... Um, you know, which is do what thou wilt is the whole of the law. It's a, it's a very selfish uh, uh, religion. Now, people say, well, what about atheists and agnostics? They don't believe in God. They don't believe in, in any holy scriptures. What about them? Well, there was actually a rabbi who said that atheists are holy. Shocker, I know. <laughs> it's, you know, pretty shocking to say. But what the rabbi meant by that is because an atheist and an agnostic either doesn't believe in God or is not certain that there is a God, he understands and realizes that if there is a need that needs to be met, that it lays with that individual and that individual alone to meet that need. So if an atheist or agnostic sees somebody that's in need, they know that, that the, the burden of proof, the responsibility lies upon them and them alone. If they don't do it, nobody else will. So they take action and they meet that need. And they know that, that they would want the same thing to be done to them if they were in that situation, if, they, you know, if the shoe was on the other foot. And so even atheists and agnostics, for the most part, agree with and practice or have some version or code of ethics regarding the golden rule. Okay, moving on. Now, the next commandment that we're going to deal with is a negative, prohibitive commandment. And basically, the gist of this one is not to stand idly by when human life is in danger. And this is taken from Leviticus 19, verse 16. It says, Do not go about spreading slander among your people. Do not jeopardize your neighbor's life. I am the Lord, cap, all in caps, meaning God's proper name. You know, it's kind of a stamp of, I mean what I said. You know, I'm putting my name behind this. So it says, do not go about spreading slander among your people. That is another commandment in and of itself, but it kind of links into uh, not harming others because in Judaism, they consider slander and gossip equal unto murder. Because if you make somebody blush with shame or embarrassment, you are actually shedding blood. You are drawing the blood from the inner part of the body to the surface of the skin, creating that red rosy color. Therefore, you have shed blood, which is equivalent to murder. And you may not have physically killed somebody be because of slander or embarrassment. You have killed someone's character or have killed someone's spirit. So they, they equate that with murder. All right, doing harm to someone else. So the second part of that verse says, do not jeopardize your neighbor's life. I am the Lord. So this commandment is, is a negative commandment in the fact that we're not to uh, just sit idly by when a neighbor's life is in danger, when another human life is in danger. That inactivity is the same as you know um it's the same as contributing to that person's demise when there is something that is within our power or realm of influence that we could have changed uh an outcome from a uh, negative to a positive outcome so do not stand idly by when your neighbor's life is in danger it's a negative commandment thou shalt not based on leviticus uh 1916. this reminds me of a story during the uh the world war during the nazi era how there was a church that was built uh very close to the railroad tracks and the train would go by every sunday and when the train would go by is when the church would be singing their hymns and the nazis would often use this rail line to cart jews to the concentration camps to the death camps they would be shipping them to these camps to die and the people in the church would hear the cries and the screams 
of these Jews sent to the death camp. But because they were afraid to do anything or to take action or afraid of the Nazi Reich and regime, they, what, what they did is they just sung a little bit louder to drown out the cries of the Jews from the railroad tracks as they were passing by the church. And uh, so we can't stand idly by when another human life is in danger. If there's something within our power, we need to step in and do something because uh, we need to uh, see life as sacred and take seriously the sanctity of life. All right, the third commandment uh, in this series of commandments here is dealing with Lashon Hara. That is the Hebrew word meaning the evil tongue or the evil speech. It's talking about gossip. It's talking about slander. And I already touched on this a little bit uh, when I was talking about the last ver or the last uh, commandment, where the Jews consider gossip and slander as character assassination, that it is another form of murder, and that's how seriously they take that. So this commandment is taken from Leviticus twenty five seventeen. You are not to cheat one another, but fear your God. I am the Lord your God. So the gist of this prohibitive commandment is to not to wrong anyone in speech and not to wrong anyone as as basically lying, false advertising, uh, not not lying or cheating someone out of something and harming them in that way. You are not to cheat one another, but fear your God, for I am the Lord again, capital L-O-R-D, your God. So that is the uh, one way we could love each other is to not do each other wrong. Uh, that's, you know, that's just another form of love, not just saying I love you or giving somebody a hug or words of affirmation or sticky, sweet, ooey, gooey, gushy love stuff. But, um, you know, not doing someone else wrong is a major way of loving someone, loving your brother, fulfilling that commandment of love. Now, back to Leviticus 19.16, and let me go ahead and read that again. It says, Do not go about spreading slander among your people. Do not jeopardize your neighbor's life. I am the Lord. So I just want to focus on that first part because this is where the next uh, commandment is coming from. Do not go about spreading slander among your people. And, uh, you know, this one is a negative thou shalt not prohibitive commandment. Um, also linked to Lashon Hara, the evil tongue or the evil speech. And basically, it's not to be a talebearer, not to be a gossiper, not to be a slanderer, um, you know, not to, to, to be causing drama in the community. And this one applies, uh, of course, in real life and face to face uh, because, you know, we're to treat each other right in the presence of one another, be, be kind, be loving, be civil. But social media, that computer screen has given a barrier of an, uh, anonymity, and if people feel a little bit more bolder and braver behind a computer screen that they can speak their mind and say what they want without any repercussion or consequences. There are certain things that you would say in front of somebody, they would flatten you out and deck you. They would punch you, right? But, you know, what's the worst that can happen if you say that same thing on social media? You know, you're just causing drama and causing a firestorm, and people retaliate verbally through words. The worst that can happen is you get banned or unfriended or what have you, right? But we're not to we're not to do that. We're not to slander and badmouth and gossip and berate and belittle and run someone down and bully someone down with our speech, whether in person, in real life, or in the virtual world, in, in cyberspace, online, and social media life, what have you, right? So that's the prohibitive commandment there. Now, Leviticus uh, 19, um, I lost my place here. Leviticus 19.17, it says, Do not harbor hatred against your brother. Rebuke your neighbor directly and you will not incur guilt because of him. So there is a commandment that we can extrapolate from Leviticus uh, 19.17. There's actually several that we can, but this particular one is more focusing on the first part of that verse. Do not harbor hatred against your brother. 
So the commandment that is extrapolated from Leviticus 19.17, it is a, uh, a negative, a prohibitive commandment. And basically the gist is not to cherish hatred in one's heart. Don't hate your neighbor. Because we know that, you know, in the New Testament, Yeshua, Jesus, actually made, it, made the commandments harder to observe. For instance, thou shalt not kill. Well, it's actually fairly easy not to go out and stab somebody or shoot someone or strangle them to death, even though you may want to. Ah, there's the rub. That's what I'm getting at. You want to, but you don't act physically upon it. You kill them mentally in your heart and in your mind. You imagine strangling them. You imagine stabbing them. You imagine shooting them or whatever. So Yeshua said, if you hate your brother, you've committed murder in your heart. So, you know, it's a heart problem, not a physical act problem, because you can pretty much restrain yourself. It's easy not to commit adultery. I don't have any problem with jumping in bed with another woman, but it's really hard for me to keep my eyes in my head and keep my mind on my own stuff, my own business. When there's a scantily clad woman that walks by or, you know, a scantily clad woman that pops up in an advertisement on TV or whatever, you know, the, my fallen inclination will want to look at her and say, wow, man, she's hot, and start undressing her in my mind and in my eyes. The Lord said, if you lust after a woman, you've committed adultery in your heart. So a lot of these commandments, especially dealing with love and brotherhood, yes, they take action, uh, but, but a lot of this takes place in the heart and the mind. It's a heart-mind issue, and very few of them are actually an outward physical uh, issue that needs to be dealt with, although we're going to get into some of those as we move along in these commandments. So not to hate um, your fellow man in your heart. Now, the other another commandment taken from Leviticus 19.18, and I'll read that again, do not take revenge or bear a grudge against members of your community, but love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord your God. So the negative prohibitive commandment that comes from Leviticus 19.18 is from the first part. Um, which is do not take revenge or bear a grudge. So not to take revenge, not a tit for tat vengeance. You know, just because he hit you, I'm going to hit him. Just because, you know, he stole from me, I'm going to steal from him. Just because he bad mouthed me in public and said something bad about me, I'm going to spread a rumor about him. Uh, no, it says do not take revenge. Be the bigger man, be the bigger person. Don't take the revenge, because the scriptures also says, uh, also says, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, I will repay. If you've been done dirty, you've been done wrong, your silence shows your respect, your love, your maturity, and your lack of seeking or trying to get or achieve revenge, you know, shows your submission and obedience to God and your trust in the Lord and your trust in his word and your trust in God himself that he will take action. He will be your defense. He will get back the person that God will take care of the situation. You don't have to do anything. Somebody did something wrong to you, did something bad to you. You don't have to get dirty. You don't have to get even. Let God do that. Let, let things work out for themselves because when people do other people wrong, they, they bring evil and they bring wrong upon themselves. And this, the, the next commandment is taken from that same verse and it comes from the other part of that first half of that verse, uh, you know, where it says, do not take revenge. Okay, we already went over that commandment, the prohibitive commandment of not taking vengeance. The other one is, or bear a grudge. Do not bear a grudge. That is another negative prohibitive commandment taken from Leviticus 19.18. Now, a grudge only hurts yourself. It's not hurting anyone else but yourself because most people can care less. Uh, they couldn't care less if, if you held a grudge against them. No skin off their back, no skin off their nose. You're the one with the problem. You're the one with the issue because this grudge is, is you mull over it. You meditate on it. You obsess about it. You think about it, and you think how much you hate this person, how much you would like to see them dead, how much you would like to get them back, how much you would like to see them get their just desserts. And you don't forgive them, and you don't love them, and you hold a grudge against them, and, and you give them the silent treatment or, or avoid them in public. That's not hurting them. They don't feel one ounce of pain from the grudge you bear. All that grudge is doing is hurting yourself, hurting your insides, hurting your spirit. It's hurting yourself. You're making yourself a prisoner of your own vice. So 
you know, we're not to bear a grudge against somebody. We're just to live and let live. We're to forgive and forget, uh, so to speak. Not saying that we make ourselves a welcome mat and open ourselves up to being taken advantage of. No, you got to protect yourself. The Bible's not saying that. You, 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 you have a right to protect yourself and not put yourself in any situation where you'll be taken advantage of or compromised. But you are to forgive that person. And not necessarily forget what they did as like, duh, 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 duh. oh, they never did this, and you fall in the same trap and allow them to do that to you again. You know, you, you, you always keep that in the back of your mind. Well, they did this, so they have a potential of being hurtful, harmful, and unfaithful, but I forgive them for what they did. I'm not going to allow myself to be uh, put in a similar situation by them again to where I'm hurt or taken advantage of in the same way. But we are to forgive them, so we're not to hold a grudge or bear a grudge. Now, Yeshua said in Matthew 6, 15, but if you do not forgive others, neither will your father forgive your transgressions. So bearing a grudge is a form of unforgiveness. And the Lord said, if, if we don't forgive others, God won't forgive us. If we don't forgive others, scriptures also tell us that God won't even hear our prayers. If we, if we go to God and we pray to him and we have, we're harboring a grudge against somebody in our heart, God's not going to listen to that prayer. You, you've got to have a clean heart, a pure heart before God. And it says if you, if you have ought against your neighbor, the scripture says, leave your gift on the altar and go reconcile things with your brother and then go back to the temple or go back to God and present your gift. So, you know, it's very important that we not bear a grudge. So that's another uh, commandment that we can apply to our life from the Torah. Now, uh, in Leviticus 19.17, uh, it says, Do not harbor hatred against your brother. Rebuke your neighbor directly, and you will not incur guilt because of him. So the negative prohibitive commandment, in Leviticus 19, 17, that we can take away uh, from this is don't put another person to shame. Do not put another person publicly to shame because it says don't harbor hatred against your brother. And it says rebuke your neighbor directly. And that implies rebuke him in private. Don't rebuke him in public. Don't rebuke him in front of you know, the neighborhood in front of the community. Don't allow him to be shamed or to, to lose face. Because again, when you shame a person and they're embarrassed to where they blush, blood is drawn from, you know, the inner part of the body to the surface of the skin, which gives the skin a reddish hue. And that is considered shedding blood and it's equivalent to murder in the eyes of Judaism. So we, if we rebuke our neighbor and we have a right to rebuke our neighbor, we're called to rebuke our neighbor when our neighbor's in the wrong, but we're to do it directly. We're to, we're, we're, we're to go to him in private and rebuke him in love. We're not to go to somebody else and say, oh, did you know what, did you hear or see or know what so-and-so did? I can't believe they did this. They have no right to do this. The Bible says it's wrong and they're going to go to hell and God's going to get them. Well, you're gossiping. You're slandering. You're, you're airing somebody else's dirty laundry to somebody else and it's none of their business. If you're offended by what somebody did or if somebody did something wrong, you're not to go parade it around with a megaphone or put it on social media saying this person did this. We need to shun him and we need to make him pay for what he did. No, the Torah says rebuke your neighbor directly. In other words, go to him in private and say, hey, man, I was really offended or I was really shocked by what you did. It appeared to me that you did this. And according to the scripture, this is wrong and we need to get this straightened out. Maybe you saw wrong. You know, if you try to publicly shame somebody, they may come back and say, hey, you got the wrong story. That's not the way it went down at all. You saw this, but actually this happened. And then you're put to shame because you took things out of context and you blew things out of proportion. So that's what, that's another reason we are to rebuke our neighbor directly, go to them in private, because maybe you understood what they said wrong, or maybe you saw what they did and took it the wrong way or didn't see the full story, the full picture. It's like a story, you know, that my friend told. You know, he said that, uh, you know, this guy used to be a believer, used to be a Christian, and, uh, you know, he fell into alcoholism, and he was drinking every day, and his, his home was full of beer bottles and beer cans, and, you know, he felt the Lord going uh, and pressing upon his heart to go and speak to this guy to try to win this brother back, and he, he's sitting on, he, he finds him sitting on the front porch, drunk, drunk out of his mind, 
you know, throw him back another, you know, 24 ounce or whatever. And so my friend sits down beside him. He, he, who was a former alcoholic himself and the Lord delivered him from that. And so he's, you know, saying, brother, we miss you. We want you to come back, you know, and everything like that. And then he grabs the beer bottle or the beer can from his hands and he holds it up and he says, this, this is your problem. And right at that time, somebody from the church or congregation passes by and all they see is the beer can and my friend's hand. And they automatically assume, oh, well, there goes Mike. He fell off the wagon. He's an alcoholic again. I saw him on the porch drinking with that other drunk skunk that used to go to church. But that's not what really happened. That's not how it went down. And what if that person who saw that went spreading that rumor that Mike's an alcoholic? And that's not what it went down. So if they saw that and were shocked and like, oh, wow, I can't believe what I'm seeing, that person needed to go to my friend Mike, take him aside privately and say, hey, I saw you at so-and-so's house the other day and it looked like you were drinking. Is that what went on? And then Mike could explain, no, 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 you just, you just caught me when I grabbed the beer can from his hand and declared, this is your problem. You know, I wasn't drinking. I was actually trying to get him to stop drinking. See, when we don't have the full story, uh, you know, we, we can commit great sin and um, be shamed ourselves. So we're not to put anybody to shame. Now, Yeshua, Jesus, had a lot to say about this. Matthew 18, verses 15 through 20, gives us the messianic protocol on how to approach somebody that we need to rebuke, somebody that's caught in error, that's caught in sin, that's done wrong. And this is how we are to approach them without bringing uh, shame upon them, without embarrassing them unnecessarily, without them losing their reputation or losing face. It says, now, if your brother sins against you, go and show him his fault while you're with him alone. Again, going back to Leviticus uh, 19, 17, that you are to rebuke your brother directly. In other words, to his face in private. And that's what Yeshua is saying because Yeshua kept the Torah. He kept the law. He showed us how to keep it correctly. And here he's reiterating Leviticus 19, 17. Now, if your brother sins against you, go to him, uh, go and show him his fault while you're, you are alone with him. If he listens to you, you have won your brother. But if he does not listen to you, take with you one or two more, so that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may stand. And again, Yeshua is using Torah here. By two or three witnesses, let everything be established. That's in the law of Moses. That's in the five books of Moses. That's in the Torah. And bringing two or three, uh, two or more witnesses, the implication is, is two or three witnesses that are not taking your side, not taking his side, but it's um, just, a, just an unbiased somebody that's from the outside, that they could be a witness to listen to what you said and to listen to what they said so that there will be no he said, she said, so that every word is established, so that there's a truthful dialogue going on there. So nobody's testimony can be misconstrued or taken out of context or nobody can lie about what the other person said. But if he does not listen, take with you one or two more so that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may stand. Verse 17, but if he refuses to listen to them, uh, tell it to Messiah's community. Some translation says, bring it before the elders of the church. In other words, uh, back then, the way that the Messianic community was set up, the congregations were set up, they had what's called a Beit Din, which means house of judgment. And it was a ruling body of elders within that synagogue or congregation, and they would you know, settle disputes among its members. So it's not saying take them before the entire church body in a public service and standing them up before everybody and shame him and say, oh, this person's a, a, a reprobate and he's a sinner and we need to shun him and blah, blah, blah. No, because it's not the congregation's business. It's your and your brother's business. And if he doesn't listen to you, bring two or more uh, from the outside that are unbiased that's within that Messianic community. And if they don't listen to you guys, then bring them before the ruling body of elders of the Messianic community of the church of the synagogue. And it says if he refuses to listen even to Messiah's community, to the ruling body of elders, in other words, let him be to you as a pagan or a tax collector. That's when you can cut ties and shun them. You excommunicate them from the congregation. 
right? And the purpose is not to be nasty, dirty, and mean. You still love them, but you just don't fellowship with them anymore. And you're giving them their space so they can think about what has happened and allow the Holy Spirit to grab a hold of their heart and to convict them, to let them know and see that they did wrong and that correct and right judgment and discipline was dished out against them, that they may come back and say, hey, you know, I realize what I did was wrong. I repent. I want to be restored back into the community. It's, it, it, it's, it's not about discipline. It's not, at, well, it's not about discipline in a way of punishing somebody. It's not about punishment. The goal in confronting your brother directly is restoration. That's the goal, is restoration and reconciliation, not chastisement, not punishment, not discipline as far as beating somebody or shaming them. Okay, so moving on. Leviticus 19.14 says, Do not curse the deaf or put a stumbling block in front of the blind. But you are to fear your God. I am the Lord. I am yud heh vav -Heh. So this is, you know, we, we know that there's a lot of people within our world who has handicaps and disabilities. They may have a speech impediment. They may have cerebral palsy and they can't walk right. They might be deaf and can't hear. They might be blind and have to use a seeing eye dog or a cane or what have you. And we're not to make fun of them. We're not to make life more hard or difficult. We're not to curse them. We're not to slander them or make fun of them. It says, do not curse the deaf. Well, it's easy to curse a deaf person because they can't hear you. They don't know they're being cursed, right? And, or put a stumbling block in front of the blind. What's the only reason you put a stumbling block in front of the blind? So you could watch them trip and fall and have a good laugh. That's evil. That's wrong. But it says, fear the Lord your, the Lord your God. So this negative, prohibitive commandment is not to uh, hurt, harm, abuse, slander, um, or uh, take advantage of somebody that is handicapped or has a disability or that is less fortunate than you. Now, there's a little rabbinic implication to this. You know, where it's talking about don't curse someone who's deaf, someone who can't hear. So the implication is, is, is if you're not allowed to curse somebody who's, who's deaf and can't hear, you certainly can't curse those who can hear. So just as equally, you, can't, you, you shouldn't curse someone who's deaf. You shouldn't curse someone who, who has perfect hearing. So if it applies to the one, it applies to the other. So that's kind of the implication, the rabbinic implication of that negative prohibitive commandment. Uh, okay, moving on. In Leviticus 19.14, it says, um, Do not curse the deaf or put a stumbling block in front of the blind. You are to fear God. I am the Lord. So this one is, as I said, dealing, it's a prohibitive commandment, dealing with not uh, harming or making fun of or taking advantage of someone who has a handicap that's deaf or blind or, or what have you. But this is also uh, kind of implying somebody who has a lesser IQ. They may not have a disability, but maybe they're gullible, right? Or maybe, you know, they're, they're just not as bright as someone else. Maybe they lack common sense, let's say, and not to uh, take advantage of them, not to cause them to uh, uh, be taken advantage of. And the deeper implication of this verse is that we shouldn't do anything that will cause someone else harm. We shouldn't do anything that will cause someone else to sin or someone else to lack or be at fault at something or to be at a disadvantage. And this, again, is a negative, prohibitive commandment. Leviticus 19.17, the second part or the B part of that verse, says, rebuke your neighbor directly. So this is considered a positive, affirmative commandment that um, we are to rebuke those that sin. Now, the other one is that we are to the, – the, the, what's, the, what's the difference is that we are to uh, rebuke a brother. We're to rebuke him in love, right? We're to go to him directly, go to him in private, and point out the wrong and uh, rebuke them to try to make things right. This one is, is saying that we should rebuke those that sin. In other words, those that, that may not know better. Maybe they're not a believer. Maybe they don't know the scriptures. Maybe they haven't been raised to really know right from wrong. Maybe they're a moral relativist. We are obligated in a loving way, not in a firm, religious, fanatic, beat somebody over the head kind of way, rebuke them, but we are to rebuke them in love and just pull them to the side and say, hey, you're probably not aware of this, but you know, God is God. He has a right to tell us what's right and wrong, 
there is no such thing as moral absolutes. There is a absolute right and absolute wrong, and what you're doing is wrong, and this is why, because the Scripture says this, and that's a way of, of witnessing to them. And also to, to kind of shatter their false notion or reality of moral relativism. Moral relativism says what's right for me and it may not be right for you. What's wrong for me may not be wrong for you. And w one example I always give is, hey, pull out a gun and say, hey, give me your money or I'm going to kill you. Well, you can't do that. That's wrong. Well, who says it's wrong? You're a moral relativist. You know, it may be wrong for you to kill another person to get their money, but it's not wrong for me. I don't consider it wrong to kill somebody else. I, I consider it a part of the evolutionary process. It's survival of the fittest. If you can't defend yourself, then too bad. I'm going to kill you and take your money. Well, that's wrong. That's murder. Who says? Who, who, there is no moral absolutes. See how ridiculous that can get when you take it to the extreme like that? So there is an absolute right and absolute wrong. And God, our creator, has that right to tell us what's right and what's wrong, to set the standards of morality. So we're to rebuke sinners, and it's an affirmative, positive commandment, but we're to rebuke them in love. Because whenever God, uh, whenever Yeshua, Jesus, was on earth, and he encountered sinners, the prostitutes, the tax collectors, he wasn't mean to them. He wasn't crass to them. He didn't beat them over the head. He didn't wag his finger and foam at the mouth and say, you're going to hell, you dirty, filthy, rotten hooker, you dirty, filth and rotten, cheat and sinner. He loved them. And by loving them, he built a rapport and a, and, and a friendship with these sinners and was able to, in a loving way, show them that they're doing wrong and that there's a better way, right? Now, who was Yeshua harsh to and mean to? It was the religious people, the religious elite, the people that knew better, right? They were, they were observant of God's law on the outside, but not on the inside. They were hypocrites. So he was harsh and mean to the hypocrites because they knew better, right? But he loved the sinner because they didn't know better. He rebuked the sinner, made no bones about what sin is, what right and wrong is, but he did it in love, and that's our example. All right, now moving on, the next commandment in this list of uh, 14 dealing with uh, love and brotherhood is taken from Exodus 23.5. It says, if you see the donkey of someone who hates you, lying helpless under its load, and you want to refrain from helping it, you must help with it. All right. Very few that are listening live in rural communities where they still have pack animals like horses and camels and donkeys that have heavy burdens and heavy loads. So, you know, taken in a literal sense, if you see somebody that has a pack animal that is clapped under the load, you are to assist that person, whether you like them or not, because it's the brotherly thing to do. It's being a decent human being, right? Whether you like that person or not, you're to help them, because if you were in that situation, you would want to be helped too. But to put this in a modern 21st century way, if you're driving by and you see your enemy's car broke down on the side of the road, you're not to drive by and go, <laughs> sucker, oh, you're finally getting what you deserved. <laughs> no, you're not to make fun of the person or to say, oh, well, you got yours or mm, yeah, you deserve that. You know, I'm going to let you stew in that and suffer in that flat tire there or, or that, you know, uh, busted transmission. No, the scriptures say, the Torah says, um, Exodus 23, 5 tells us that if we see an enemy on the side of the road, uh, you know, in a modern way, if their car is broken down, their motorcycle is broken down, or if they're stranded for whatever reason on the side of the road, that we are to assist them. Well, I'm not mechanical. I don't know how to change a tire. Well, you got a cell phone, call AAA, call a tow truck, whatever. Do what you can to help that person. Don't make an excuse not to help. Find an excuse or find a way to help. So. You know, Yeshua talked about how, you know, if, if you love people that love you, what is that? Who cares? Even, you know, even tax collectors and sinners do that. Even evil people, bad guys do that. They love those who love them. But what sets, up, sets us apart and makes us different as a holy set-apart people is that we love our enemies. We're to love our neighbor as ourselves, but we're to love our enemies. Yeshua on the cross, his enemies put him on the cross, nailed him to the cross, beat him to a bloody pulp, made him, according to Isaiah, unrecognizable as a human being. And what did he say? Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. So love your enemies. Yeshua said in Matthew 5, um, 43 through 48, you have heard it, you have heard it 
that it is well said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemy and pray for them who persecute you so that you may be children of your father in heaven. He causes the sun to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Even tax collectors do the same thing, don't they? And if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than anyone else? Even the pagans do that, don't they? Therefore, be perfect, be complete, just as your Father in heaven is perfect and complete. So this is a um, this is an uh, affirmative command that we are to help our neighbor. And it doesn't matter if you're friends or enemies with your neighbor. We are to love our neighbor and help our neighbor and assist our our neighbor in their trials, troubles, and tribulations. There's other passages that says that we need to give, uh, you know, a cup of cold water in Yeshua's name, and we need to give, we need to feed and clothe our, our our enemy. And if our enemy is hungry or thirsty, we need to give him food and clothes, and and we'll be rewarded. And and as a result, we'll heap hot coals upon that person's head. You want you want sweet revenge? You want to get somebody back? Kill them with kindness. That's how you get revenge. That's how you get them back. Is you kill them with kindness. That's the only scriptural, biblical, acceptable revenge. <laughs> and that's the sweetest revenge of all. Because, you know, when you love your enemy, you turn your enemy into an ally. Um, I've told this story before, but uh, at one time in high school, there's this guy who didn't like me for whatever reason. Don't know why. Maybe I was just that proverbial 90-pound wuss. I was a soft, easy target. So he decided to, p to hate on me and pick on me. And one one day I came to school and he wanted to pick a fight. You know, he started pushing me around, making fun of me. Him and his buddies are calling me a wimp and a sissy and everything. So to that day I decided to give him what he thought he wanted. I said, do you want to fight? He's like, yeah, come on, let's go. I said, you want to throw? Yeah, let's throw. He threw down his book bag. I threw down my book bag. I threw off my jacket. He threw off his jacket. And by this time, we had that circle of people surrounding us. And, and he had his fist up and he's dancing around like he's ready for the fight. And I come right up to him, put my finger right in his nose, and I said, Tony, I don't care what you do to me. I don't care what you say to me. I love you, and Jesus Christ loves you. And he stops dancing around. His eyes get real big, and his fists drop. And we never fought. He turned into my friend that day. And he started sticking up for me and defending me when other people wanted to fight me and other people wanted to make fun of me. Because I didn't give him what he wanted, I gave him love. I didn't give him any reason to hate me. I didn't give him any ammunition. I loved my enemy, and through that, I turned him into an ally. Now, with these commandments, sometimes we can take the same commandment and make a positive affirmation from it and a negative prohibition from it. And, uh, um, you know, or we can make several positive affirmations or several prohibitions from one verse. Now, this one technically. Uh, you know, we're to relieve uh, a neighbor of his burden and help to unload his beast that's kind of fallen, uh, you know, a beast that's fallen under the weight of its burden on the side of the road, right? So I liken that unto helping somebody whose car broke down, okay? Now, there's an another commandment, and it's based off of pretty much the same principle in a very similar verse. The first one I read was Exodus 23.5. This one is Deuteronomy 22.4. And it says, if you see your brother's donkey or ox fallen on the road, do not ignore it. Help him lift it up. And from this one, the first one is we help somebody unload. And this one is we help somebody load. So if somebody's broken down, you know, uh, we, we help them in whatever way we can. This one, we, you know, is is the picture of, you know, uh, the first part is unloading the, the donkey or the beast of burden or whatever and unloading it because it fell under its own weight. And we pack the stuff back on the animal and reposition the weight so it doesn't tip over, doesn't collapse, or the weight is evenly distributed so that the animal can carry its burden. Um, so this commandment is to assist to replace the load upon the neighbor's beast. Okay, so like if we wanted to put it in the modern vernacular, if you see that person broken down onto the side of the road, uh, you help them with, you know, maybe, maybe unloading. In other words, helping them take off a tire, right? And uh, loading the beast back would be helping to put the tire back on. 
that would be a modern way of fulfilling that commandment, um, you know, or helping the, the person see that person on their way. Maybe you can't change a tire. Maybe the best you can do to unload the burden is to call a tow truck for that person and stay there until, you know, the, the car is taken care of and towed away and say, hey, man, can I give you a ride or do you need a lift or is there any way that I can help you? Um, so this is a, a positive way of fulfilling the commandment. So sometimes when we run across commandments in the scripture that see, that that's set in an, in, in an archaic or ancient time, such as, you know, this thing about unloading donkey and, and loading back up a donkey, we need to look at that and say, oh, well, that doesn't apply to us anymore because we don't live in rural areas like that and we don't use donkeys to haul stuff anymore. So this this commandment no longer applies. No, we need to take that commandment and say, okay, what is the principle behind the commandment? What's the commandment really trying to say? And let's find the modern equivalent to that commandment so we can fulfill that commandment, right? So we, we can fulfill it. All right, and so finally, the last commandment in this list of 14 regarding love and brotherhood is a negative prohibitive commandment. And again, it's taken from these same verses from, from Exodus and Deuteronomy that we read. And this one says, not to leave a beast that has fallen down beneath its burden unaided. In other words, you know, if, if we see, uh, you know, the, if we see an animal, this, this would be more akin to uh, not only loving your neighbor, but loving an animal. Let's see that, let's say that, you, you know, somebody is, uh, you see somebody walking their dog or, or, or walking their pet and their pet somehow gets injured or hurt uh, or gets attacked by another animal or gets hit by a car or whatever. We're not to say, oh, well, too bad for you, you know, sorry for that. You know, we're to do what we can to help that person because that animal is more than just a pet. Most likely it's, it's very like a child or like a family member to that person. Um, or maybe, you know, it's beyond that. Maybe, maybe it's a person that has a seeing eye dog that was hurt or injured or sick or whatever. Um, so, so it's to be kind to animals, not only to be kind to people, but to be kind to animals. So whether animal or human, if we see someone in need, the gist of these commandments is that we are to show our love towards them by doing what we can within our power to help them. Maybe that's calling the vet. Maybe that's helping that person transport that animal to the veterinarian. Uh, maybe that's um, you know just staying and comforting that person until help arrives, uh, or comforting that animal until help arrives, or you know uh, uh, you know getting the first aid kit out of your car and trying to do what you can until the proper you know help arrives or whatever for that animal or for that person. It's basically doing whatever you can within your power to help that person or to help that animal. So we are not to see a human or an animal that's in need and ignore that need and pass it by and say, oh, well, you know, too bad for you. So too bad. So sad. No, because if we were in that similar same situation, we would want somebody to stop and help us. And this reminds me of, you know, how these laws are all kind of summed up in the story of the Good Samaritan. Uh, taken from Luke chapter 10, verse 25 through thir uh, 37. In the NIV, it says, On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Yeshua, to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law, he replied. How do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind. And love your neighbor as yourself. Okay, see, there's that commandment again. The second command that's likened to the first that's as equal or just as great as the first, love your neighbor as yourself. What are we command, What are we dealing with? 14 commandments dealing with brotherly love, with brotherhood and with love, right? So if you love your neighbor as yourself, you're probably automatically already keeping these 14 commandments that fall under that category. Okay, it says, moving on, you have answered correctly, Jesus replied, do this and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself. So he asked Jesus, well, who is my neighbor? Define neighbor. Is a neighbor somebody that's just like me, the same religion, same faith, same ethnicity, same neighborhood, same community, same socioeconomic status as me? Who is my neighbor? Is somebody that I live beside or is there a broader term, a broader definition for neighbor? Right. Verse 30. In reply, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went and went away, leaving him half dead. Okay, so you get this guy who was mugged, who was robbed and mugged and left for dead. Verse 31, a priest. Who is a priest? A lot of times when you say priest, you think of a black-clad 
yellow, a white collared Catholic priest. Priest was a Levite. He was somebody that was a, a was a, was a Levite, a Levitical priest that worked in the temple, uh, that performed sacrifices. Right, a priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. He ignored this person that was in need. Perhaps the priest was saying, "Gee, it's my duty." to perform sacrifices at the temple. If I stop and help this man who's half dead to check on him, I will become unclean coming in contact with him because he's bloody and beaten and half dead, and then I'll be exempt from my priestly duties. Well, serving God is more important than serving other people, so I'm just going to ignore him because the temple takes greater priority. Uh Uh-uh. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. If If you're loving your neighbor, you're loving God. God doesn't need your acts of service at church or synagogue or in the temple. Somebody else can pick up the slack. Somebody else can do it. Something else can be worked out. Life over law, right? Uh, uh, The sanctity of life. A a person's life is more important than religious duty. So a priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too a Levite. Now, a Levite is... Uh, it, it may not be a priest as far as pr- performing the sacrifices, but he also had duties in the temple. He had responsibilities in the temple of God. When he came to the place and saw the man, he passed by on the other side. Perhaps he too was saying, well, if I, if I come in contact with this guy, get embroiled in you know, his circumstances, I won't be able to serve at the temple. God's service is more important than this, than this guy. Again, probably the same mistake as the priest made. I'm just assuming this is what was going through their mind, right? So to a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, and he passed by on the other side. So a priest and a Levi, if anybody was an expert in the law, they were experts in the law, right? They should know the heart behind the law, not just the literal black and white physical commandments, but the heart of the law. What does it really mean? What's the spiritual application? It's easy to keep the physical principles of the law, but the spiritual applications. Verse 33, but a Samaritan. Now, why a Samaritan? A Samaritan was somebody that was hated by the Jewish people. They were, they were hybrids. They were half-breeds. They were half-Gentile, half-Jewish. Therefore, they were not really Jewish at all. They had a weird customs and traditions. They were despised, right? They were the, they were the lower economic strata, the lower you know, despised ethnic group. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was. And when he saw him, he took pity on him. And went to him and bandaged his wounds, poured oil and wine, uh, basically triage, gave him first aid, did what he could to help the guy. Probably he was a merchant, probably, and not a doctor, right? Then he put the man on his own donkey and brought him to an inn and took care of him. He paid for a motel and paid for the supplies to nurse this guy back to health. According to the law, the, guy, the guys who beat him up, mugged him, should have been captured, caught, put on trial, and their punishment would do be to nurse this guy back to health and pay back several times what they stole from him. But basically, this Samaritan took it upon himself to do that. So it says, the next day he took out two denarii and gave it to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you from any extra expense you may have. Which of these three the priest, the Levite, or the Samaritan, do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell in the hands of robbers? Verse 37, the expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Ding, 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 (laughs) ding. Bingo. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. See, there's the letter of the law and there's the spirit of the law. Both need to be fulfilled, not just the letter of the law. Using the letter of the law alone, sometimes you can find loopholes and make excuses now not to keep the spirit of the law, right? Just like those that priests and Levi, well, if I come in contact with this guy, I'll become unclean and won't be able to serve in the temple. I won't be able to perform my duties for God. They were putting the letter of the law above the spirit of the law. The spirit of the law is love your neighbor as yourself. Help a person. It doesn't matter if it interferes with your religious duties. God can do without your religious duties. You need to love some, love other people and help them. 
Well, I do truly hope that going over each one of the 613 commandments, that it really helps you to see that these commandments are still applicable and obligatory for believers in Messiah Yeshua today, and that they're not, not something hard to keep. It's not like you have to climb a mountain or jump through fiery hoops. They're very down-to-earth and practical commandments that we can all keep and that we should keep that makes us a better, better person, a better believer, a better follower of God. And when we walk, when we keep these commandments, we are walking in the footsteps of Yeshua, our Messiah. He's the one who taught us and visibly showed us how to keep the commandments correctly. Not only the letter of the law, but the spirit of the law. And hopefully I'm able to bring this out through this series, not only of you know what it literally says in black and white, but how to take these commandments that were written thousands of years ago and make them applicable to today in our lives in the 21st century. Hey guys, thanks so much for listening. Go out there and have a great day. God bless. Abrahamsdescendants.com, getting back to the first century in a 21st century way. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to press the like button as well as the subscribe button if you haven't done so already and the notification bell that'll let you know every time I make a new video. And don't forget to share this with a friend. Also, visit our website at abrahamsdescendants.com. Thanks. Shalom. Thanks for watching. Stay connected by subscribing to our other social media accounts and visiting our website at abrahamsdescendants.com.